M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 160 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It's Wednesday, February 14th, 2024. Happy Valentine's Day. I'm Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. Aside from our usual coverage of the New York Attorney General civil fraud trial, the Fulton County District Attorney's case and the embarrassing, ever embarrassing House Republican caucus, we have some more follow up on a motion denied in the Eugene Carroll case, as well as an update on poor Peter Navarro's contempt and finally Jeffrey Clark's disbarment. Oh, so many good things. And we have a story today on the FBI arrest of a border militia sniper. Pete, I thought that this would be good to to bring up with you. For sure. Uh, and we have the special counsel report on President Biden's handling of classified documents or mishandling and the Supreme Court hearing on Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. But first, we would like to thank some new patrons and thanks to everybody who showed up on Friday's happy hour. That was super fun. So thank you very much to Robert Henderson, the best Patreon. R.B., Jacqueline Lee, uh, Cassie Deala, uh, I hope I got that right, Barry Gribble, Brandy Kubel, Prince Fu, and Zippy the Wonder Slug. Apparently a very quick slug. Thank you so much. You make this show possible. We couldn't do, do it without you. So we really appreciate all of your support. Look forward to seeing some of you in April in D.C. for a, a thank you party that we're throwing for you. And uh, if you weren't selected uh, for the lottery to be able to to attend that. We've got several other live events coming up. We'll keep you posted. Pete, it's Valentine's Day. So I'd like to start in New York where the love between Trump lawyers and Justice and Goron is palpable. <laughs> it's <laughs> can you feel the love tonight? I mean, it's it's fantastic. So last week, Justice and Goron presiding over the New York Attorney General civil fraud trial in New York, which the AG is now asking for $370 million in fines and to ban Trump and his man children from operating businesses in the state. Uh, and Goron sent a letter to the parties asking them for more information on Weisselberg's alleged perjury plea negotiations, saying that if true, he could invoke falsus in uno, which is short for falsus in uno, falsus in omnibus. And you'll remember on last week's show, Pete, I asked whether Judge Angoron, we were talking to Ben Mysalis, and I asked whether he had delayed his verdict. Remember, he was supposed to do it on January 31st, but it moved to mid-February. Because he might have to review all of Weisselberg's testimony, because if he lies about one thing, that certainly calls into question the veracity of all of his testimony. Well, it turns out there's actually a legal doctrine for that. It's called falsus in uno, which means false on one thing, false in all things. So the judge asked the parties to tell him, within the bounds of their ethical obligations as lawyers, what they know about the perjury plea negotiations reported by the New York Times. So Alina Haba wrote back as Weisselberg's attorney. I didn't know she was <laughs> representing Weisselberg and said only the best. She can't only the best. Yeah, <laughs> only the best people. Uh, she said she can't talk about it because of lawyer ethics, which is kind of funny coming from her. Uh, the New York attorney general wrote back uh, to Judge Angoron and said, you know, you don't need confirmation of a plea deal to invoke falsus in uno. We proved at trial that Weisselberg lied on the stand. So go ahead and make your ruling uh, based on that. You don't need to delay. And then Trump's family lawyer shot back and accused the judge of using the New York Times article to make his decisions and to invoke falsus in uno. Now, I, I tweeted about that because it was clear to me that the judge was asking for information about the perjury deal to use to weigh his decision. He wasn't going to make his ruling based on the New York Times. That's why he asked the parties for more details. And the judge was on the same page. He shot back. 
Shortly after I tweeted about that, he wrote to the Trump family lawyer. He said, when I sent my straightforward, narrow request for information about possible perjury by Alan Weisselberg in the case, I was not seeking to initiate a wide ranging debate with you. However, your misleading response grossly mischaracterizes the letter that I wrote, and I feel compelled to respond. Arguing against judicial notice is attacking a straw person, as I have not taken, do not plan to take, and did not suggest or hint that I would take judicial notice of the subject, uh, New York Times article, or the contents thereof. Similarly, I have not taken, do not plan to take, and did not suggest or hint that I would take the Times article into consideration in my findings of fact. Similarly, I have not planned to, do not plan, and do not suggest or hint that I would invoke falsus in uno based on the story. Any such invocation would be based on his trial testimony or his guilty plea. He goes on to say, you and your co-counsel have been questioning my impartiality since the early days of this case, presumably because I sometimes rule against your clients. That whole approach is getting old. Your invocation of Michael Cohen's testimony and its veracity is completely out of bounds. You have already submitted your post-trial briefs and made your final arguments. I'm not reopening the case, but if someone pleads guilty to committing perjury in a case over which I am presiding, I want to know about it. Uh, there's nothing further in this case as of the recording of this episode, which, you know, we record Monday, February 12th, but we will keep you posted. The judge is set to rule mid-February, but he he may be waiting on information about the guilty plea, uh, but he also may be weighing that damning report he got from the Trump Organization Fiscal Monitor, retired Judge Barbara Jones, with that $50 million loan we discussed with Ben Mysalis in the last episode. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense for him to wait. I mean, I think this is probably the closest we'll ever see Judge Gore and the Samuel L. Jackson and Pulp Fiction saying, what part of more information did you not, you know, insert swear <laughs> words here, understand? I, you know, I it was a small, straightforward request. If you have information that you can ethically provide, provide it. Um, and then, of course, the, the legal dream team of Donald J. Trump then proceeded to do everything in their power to both create fundraising emails and enrage the judge at the same time. So what I thought was interesting, at least my non, not a lawyer reading of the New York attorney general's response was, look, rule now, because even if adverse information comes out later, there are still avenues and mechanisms where you can use that if you so choose, in an adverse way towards your judgment. So it's it was essentially saying, no need to wait. You have all the information you need. And if further adverse information comes up, which is specifically about Weisselberg and his testimony, there are avenues for you to seek sanctions based on that later determined knowledge. So, uh, you know, and then they cited to, to a bunch of case law how that gave the judge uh, the power to do it. Now, whether Judge Ngoran finds that persuasive or not, whether he not whether he wants to just simply wait and not have to go through some sort of stair step approach to like well I'm going to rule this way and if more information comes out I can adjust my ruling at this point you know if there is if there are truly plea discussions uh, underway I, you know it may not be days but I would certainly think based on the New York Times reporting that you know that is something comparatively close that for Judge and Gorin to wait until mid February or to wait until March doesn't really uh, in my mind. If it allows him to have a complete sort of ruling to take everything into account, think about, as you said, Judge Jones is sort of reporting on that bizarre, you know, the the, the parking loan and everything else about the, the, her stewardship of, of some of the, the business dealings. I would think he'd just simply want to wait and, and get it done. And again, for, for Trump, he's not going to delay this past trial. All this delay does right now is kick a February 2024 story into a March or even April 2024 story. So, and again, None of this, things are all going bad for Trump. None of this is a bright sky. None of this is like, oh, look, there's a break in the clouds. It is like, oh, shit, the the, the gray clouds just went to two tornadoes bearing down on me from different directions. So I would say if if I had to guess, which is always stupid and, you know, I hate when other people do it, but I'm going to go ahead and do it anyway. Uh, Judge Ngoran waits to see if there are any sort of guilty pleas or further official information about that and just issues one ruling. Yeah, because it didn't seem like anybody confirmed or denied that those negotiations were going on. Um, New York Attorney General was like, even if they are, we gave you the documentary evidence that you can use to invoke falsus in uno. You don't need the addition of, uh, of, a, of a DA seeking a, a guilty plea on perjury to do that. Um, and like you said, there's more avenues later for you to um, 
look at sanctions. Yeah, and speaking of sanctions, let's let's stay in New York. When we had a ruling filing from Judge Lewis Kaplan and Alina Haba's motion for a mistrial in the Eugene Carroll case. Now the ruling reads: During the trial, Mr. Trump moved for a mistrial on the grounds that Ms. Carroll quote admitted that she deleted multiple email messages pertaining to reported death threats made to her unquote. This is all from within the ruling. The motion ignored, among other things, the fact that Ms. Carroll had acknowledged nearly a year earlier having deleted such material, and Mr. Trump did not even suggest that he had sought to recover the deleted material by discovery or otherwise in the intervening period. The court immediately denied the motion, which was without merit. And the ruling then goes on to say that, hey, look, Ms. Carroll didn't have a duty to preserve ESI before she spoke to George Conway about potential litigation because, as she had testified, she wasn't considering litigation until then. And then, even if she had a duty to preserve these messages, they wouldn't have helped Trump's case. They would hurt it <laughs> because she, as it turns out, deleted death threats. Now, based on all these considerations, the judge denied both Trump's oral request for a mistrial and... Alina Haba's undoubtedly finely crafted letter request for a mistrial for the same purpose. And then once that denial was on the docket, you'll remember asking like, hey, this hasn't, there's not an order in it yet. But once that denial was on the docket, the judge then entered the official order for the $83.3 million award for E. Jean Carroll on the docket. Now, again, a couple of things to keep in mind, right? One, this is a federal uh, case, not a New York state case. Two, that even if Trump appeals it, there are things based on this judgment that he is going to have to do to essentially guarantee or pony up this money. So it may not be going to E. Jean Carroll yet, but he is going to have to you know, find some scratch pretty quickly to be able to satisfy this, regardless of his you know, desire to appeal all and any of this. So, and again, as we've talked about before, the dirty little secret about Trump is he, despite his all his puffery and you know bragging, he is not a liquid his his wealth is not particularly liquid and this has been true going back to the you know his campaign in 15 and 16 he may have a lot of value in real estate a lot of that may be in the brand name such as it is for trump because who doesn't want uh, a trump stake or a trump education or a trump son-in-law investment uh, vehicle but be that as it may 83.3 million dollars is not the kind of easy thing for him despite everything he says so like oh yeah just pull out the checkbook i can write this yeah. And and I think what's extra funny about this is if he does pull 83.3 million out of the Trump org, which he would have to do because it's illegal for him to pull it out of the pack, uh, he would have to notify. Uh, he, so if he wants to pull 83.3 million out for the E. Jean Carroll case, he would have to notify retired Judge Barbara Jones in the New York Attorney General's case because she is a fiscal monitor over that money. You'll remember one of her reports was um, – you know, like $48 million is missing. Uh, so I asked Trump about it and turns out $29 million was for a tax bill and $5.5 million was for the bond to put into escrow for the first E. Jean Carroll settlement. So, or not settlement, but uh, award. So <laughs> if he wants to pull money out for one case, he's got to notify somebody in another case because he is being fiscally babysat right now by a retired judge because of his, uh, you know, his criming. So that's fun. I think that's funny. Um, just maybe it's, maybe it's just me. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, for sure. And look, it is not going to be the, the man, in my opinion, has never done anything above board in his life. Everything has been tainted by shenanigans and vexatious litigation and outright alleged and proven illegality. There is no reason to have any expectation that's going to change in February 2024. So I would be shocked, frankly, if maybe not in this case, but if you add this case to the New York state civil trial to anything else, I would be shocked if there are not potentially eventual FEC violations or fundraising violations or something because the man is incapable of adhering to the law, in my opinion. So, uh, you know, this this is no different. It's a lot of money for anyone. It's a lot of money for Trump. He is not, you know, Daddy Warbucks billionaire, you know, times five. This is a lot of money and it's liquid money. So, you know, I hope I, I would love to see uh, a, some sale of real estate or, you know, whatever, second mortgage it, whatever you do for a, you know, 
$50 million property. I have no idea what the- Yeah. And he's accused of falsifying his liquidity in cash uh, as well. So- And the other, <laughs> thing, gonna... the other thing too is like but behind all this, and I would love, there was a lot of reporting and some, some really good in-depth New York Times reporting on this a few years ago. He's got a ton of debt that's coming up for refinancing. And so none of this is going to help him in that process. The willingness of banks, particularly even Deutsche Bank, who I-, I Boggles my mind that under a deferred prosecution agreement that they haven't been charged in some way, shape, or form about these loans they agreed to give them. As he goes to seek to refinance a lot of this debt he has coming due, none of this helps him on the refinancing front. And the way, of course, banks typically do, you know, they assess risk. I mean, on the far end, they simply won't loan to you, but the higher risk you are, and it's true if you're a consumer applying for a credit card or somebody like Donald Trump trying to, to refinance debt... The way you assess risk in part is greater collateral on the one hand and two higher interest rates, which both, you know, Trump is not going to be happy with. But hey, you made your bed, buddy. So enjoy laying in that just flea infested, you know, shithole. Right. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Maza- Mazars no longer um, backs their financial statements on Trump for, for loan purposes. They've withdrawn their support of that and their own documents. Uh, based on the New York Attorney General uh, trial. Also, there's a fiscal monitor, a uh, babysitting. Uh, you know, nobody's going to want to lend to him, not even Ladder Capital or Rosemary Vrablick or, you know, nobody else. Well, has, so. yeah, MBS and Vladimir Putin and, you know, sort of a bunch of oligarchs and probably like swoop in to help. But we'll, we'll, well, we'll, yeah, but even he's only running for president. <laughs> even Jared Kushner, who's got two billion of, of uh, Saudi money, is is drawing millions of dollars out of the Save America Pact to pay his own legal bills. So it's it's all just a, a it's the whole house of cards is is going to is going to fall down here. And I think it'll happen this month. All right. We have a lot more news to get to, but we have to take a quick break. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, welcome back. We have more new patrons to thank. Mama G, Waxer57, Kathy Sonneborn, Whidbey Island fans of Beans, Jack, and 45, Jasmine Sicott, Michelle HW, DJ Briard, Swinky, and Tax the Church. Thank all of you for your support. Uh, you are partners in this uh, without whom we simply couldn't do the show. So to all of you, thank each and every one of you for your support and allowing us to put this together to talk about all of these so important events. And with that, uh, it's time to start the lightning round time. Let's start Ooh. Captain Underpants. Let's go to Jeffrey Clark. <laughs> now, last Tuesday, the D.C. Appellate Court denied Jeffrey Clark his bid to delay attorney disciplinary hearings over his efforts to help Donald Trump overturn the results of the 2020 presidential election. The D.C. Bar Office of Disciplinary Counsel filed ethics charges against Clark in July 2022, coming up on two years now. Not quite. Two and a half, one and a half. Those proceedings have been paused for several months as the results of various appeals move forward. Clark motioned to have the case against him removed to a federal court in October 2022. A federal judge denied that request in June of last year in an opinion finding federal courts have no jurisdiction over attorney licensing disputes. Later that year, in November of last year, the board overseeing the professional misconduct case rescheduled the proceedings to begin this January. Clark was able to pause that order once again by filing a motion to stay with the U.S. Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia in December of last year. Now, a three-judge panel, however, made up of two Trump-appointed judges, Naomi Rao, who is certainly uh, you know, not afraid to, to uh, voice her judicial support for a lot of causes friendly to Trump, and Gregory T- Katsas, and one Joe Biden-appointed judge, Brad Garcia, declined unanimously to further delay the long-running ethics case. Clark tried to argue that since the D.C. criminal proceedings for Trump are delayed pending his immunity appeal, the, the D.C. circuit should delay Jeffrey Clark's disbarment proceedings. Because <laughs> that, you know, logically, in, in the, the, the grinding wheels of the inner workings of Jeffrey Clark's brain, that somehow makes sense. But the appeals court didn't even address his arguments, simply unanimously denied his motion for a stay. So, so sad. Yeah. It would appear, I, you know, the question is, can you be the attorney general if you've been disbarred from the practice of law? I, you know, question for the attorneys out there. But. <laughs> in, a, in, a, in a Trump administration? Yeah, probably. 
Yeah, well, if there's probably Rick, some sort of waiver. Rick Grinnell that would can be, be the director of national intelligence. <laughs> Jeffrey Clark. Can be the... Some waiver written by the new pay dag, who would be Robert Hur, probably. Uh-huh. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, uh, so, yeah, just vote. All right, next up, your buddy, your brother by name, Pete, Pete Navarro. Uh, Green, he, Bay you know, he, Green Bay Sweet. Green Bay Sweet. Green Bay Sweet. Hats off to the. Taylor Swift's boyfriend's team for winning the Super Bowl uh, last night as we tape. But anyway. Great, great CIA op that we pulled up. <laughs> now, you know, Pete Navarro had asked, just like Bannon did, had asked Judge Amit Mehta uh, if he could stay out of jail for the pendency of his appeal. Meaning, you know, I'm going to appeal the ruling here that I have to go to prison for four months for my contempt of Congress, for, for basically flat out denying a subpoena from the January 6th committee. Now, in Bannon's case, he 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 made that plea to Judge Nichols, and Judge Nichols let Bannon out. That's why Bannon still hasn't served his contempt of Congress prison sentence, because he's still appealing that. So I thought, well, they'll probably let Navarro out. It's the same exact crime, uh, same exact circumstances, same exact sentence, four months. Um, but nope, Judge Amit Mehta said, no, sir, you do not get to stay out of jail pending appeal. You've been sentenced to four months and uh, we're just waiting now, I guess, to hear when he has to report to prison. So he will be going to jail this year. Yeah. And I've been like hitting refresh on my, uh, the, the BOP sentencing, like essentially we'll sit there and say, it's not sentencing. The sentence has been imposed. BOP will come back and say, Hey, you're to report to this facility on this date. And I haven't seen that yet, but as soon as that is in, that's, that's it. Um, that is his reporting date. I mean, I, I assume he could probably try, uh, but an appeal to the Supreme Court. But given that the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals didn't even take it up, uh, you know, I think that's a long shot, and I don't think it'll get stayed uh, in the interim. So, you know, hit, you know, keep going to to BOP report Peter Navarro, and uh, we should hopefully find out. I would expect within thirty days, if not sooner, uh, when and where P is going to have to to show up to go to the poke. Yeah. And I'm sure he'll file like my niece's daughter's friend is getting married and I have to, can you put it all like he'll, he'll file for more delay and those will probably be denied. So, uh, but I don't think that that'll delay it very much. Um, so anyway. Yeah. Bye, and so <laughs> Not you. <laughs> <laughs> no, enjoy that time. Cause he, he has the temperament and personality that really wins over friends in prison. So I'm sure that'll yeah, you know, being an exciting period for him in his life, but uh, you know what? I just all the all the inmates are like, "Will you sit down at the chow table, please? Why are you keep standing up? Just sit down. You're making why are you me nervous, shouting? Man. Why are you sh- why are you speaking in all capitals? <laughs> what what is wrong with with you? I just I just want somebody like the the woman in anarchy. What's her name? Who stands behind him, blowing the whistle with a big oh, sign yeah. every every time he try mm-hmm. and give a speech outside of the D.C. courthouse? But the good news is, you know, if it doesn't take too long, he'll be out of jail, the convicted felon. Uh, or I guess it's a misdemeanor, right? So it's uh, no, no, it's a felony. So he'll be out of jail in time to uh, you know, be in the latter part of the campaign for Trump. We'll see how eager Donald is to to take him up on that. Uh, so, but while we're in D.C. and you know, mentioned the Supreme Court, the Supreme Court heard arguments on Section Three of the Fourteenth Amendment. Uh, now it was interesting because sort of right. Off the bat, both Justices Kavanaugh and Alito seemed to indicate that if Trump had been charged with insurrection, he'd be off the ballot. So then you know that, you know, kind of just acknowledging that is also sort of acknowledging, look, he's not immune from criminal prosecution. Right. They were they were talking about it like it was obvious. Right. The, the questions are not, hey, is it even reasonable for him to be charged at all? That was almost a given by the entire court. So I think as far as an eventual, you know, a decision one way or the other about whether they take up the immunity argument from the D.C. Circuit or not, I, I think their mind is very much set that, no, he's not immune. But The arguments, though, were mostly about whether Section 3 of the 14th Amendment are self-executing or not. And to this end, though, almost the whole court, I mean, it seemed across the board, liberal and conservative judges all seem to think through their questioning that it's not. And Judge uh, Katanji Brown Jackson brought up the history of the 14th Amendment and talked about it was about preventing rogue states from filling their own governments or the U.S. Congress with Confederates, not federal offices. So, you know, when you when you get this, when I, you know, my sense of reading it was one, the court is looking for an off ramp. They, they don't want to have to decide this, uh, certainly on a case by case basis, but even for entertaining the questions about, you know, what is an insurrection? What would, uh, you know, that look like in the context of all these different state procedures? If they can find 
a earlier first principle way to get off this sort of road highway and get themselves out of that position, I think they're going to do it. And what was interesting was that sense of wanting to do that, I think, was sort of universally held by the conservatives and the liberals on the court. What's going to be interesting and what some constitutional scholars were, were talking about after the fact is like, look, this this sounds pretty agreeable during oral argument. The challenge is going to become when you try and sit down and actually write that out in a way that is logically cohesive, that hopefully all nine or eight justices will agree to, that suddenly gets a lot more complicated. And though there was a lot of like apparent, you know, sunshine and happiness and agreement that during oral argument, that that might prove much, much harder to translate into a written product that you could get a unanimous or near unanimous court to sign on to. Yeah. I mean, it took four weeks for the DC circuit to put together a unanimous ruling on immunity, which is a very, a very seemingly simple question. Like, duh, he doesn't have immunity. He doesn't have absolute immunity and the, and that the impeachment judgment clause doesn't, uh, you know, put him in double jeopardy. Um, in fact, the opposite and like 17 different, even if scenarios. So uh, I think this one is even uh, more complex, but yeah, it seems like they're leaning to go, uh, leaning toward uh, going with the fact that it's not self-executing. Congress would need to pass some sort of a legislation or make a determination. Um, and you know, I've long felt that they will keep him on the ballot, uh, but say that he can be criminally prosecuted. But I am interested uh, in reading the the decision and some of the dissents, if there are any, because. The plain language, you know, they never even got into the argument. Like, what happens if you have a, co a confederate who wants to become president? Like, we should probably address that. Uh, and I imagine the answer will be, yeah, it should be addressed by Congress. Uh, we'll see uh, what happens because that, you know, that makes, basically makes it so that no one can throw them off the ballot. Um, but it also, I think, robs the states from their ability to run the elections how they how they want. So uh, I'm I'm going to definitely read that, and we'll talk about it. Uh, when the decision comes out, but I, I, I'm pretty certain they're going to keep him on the ballot. Um, finally, um, we <laughs> we had the Robert Hur special counsel report, 400 pages, on uh, President Biden's uh, handling of classified documents. Top line, uh, despite all the superfluous language about you know diagnosing him with neurological disorders or whatever happened, uh, I, I the the top. The top line of this report is that there was not enough to charge any crimes. And there wouldn't be even if he wasn't a sitting president, because, you know, the Office of Legal Counsel member that says you can't charge a sitting president, even if that didn't exist, he said, we wouldn't have the evidence here. Uh, the, the way he wrote it was weird. In the beginning, he said that he willfully that President Biden willfully retained national defense information. But later on in the report said there was not enough evidence to show that he willfully retained it. So um, and that, you know. All, all, all of if you actually read the report, which I think he and many others are counting on people not reading the report, it shows clearly that there was no crime here. Um, but the superfluous extra, what a lot of people are referring to as gratuitous language, saying he comes across as a, a friendly old guy who can't remember stuff and didn't remember, uh, you know, the year his son died and all that other stuff uh, it, it was completely unnecessary and doesn't belong, I think, in a special counsel report. It seemed politically motivated. And I think it goes against the Department of Justice's policy to not get political. This seemed very political to me. It didn't really have anything to do with the facts or evidence. Uh, I mean, I couldn't imagine like Mueller writing in his report like, yeah, I mean, uh, he, you know, told us to fire the special counsel and he told Don McGahn to fire the special counsel, which is seems like it rises to the three elements of obstruction. And he's also gross and he smells bad. Like, I just, I can't imagine to, he forgot a bunch of things. He, you know, even in Trump's responses, written responses to Bob Mueller, 30 times there were things he couldn't recall or didn't remember. And he didn't even, he didn't even consent to an interview after all the big talk no. about. And and Mueller didn't even, couldn't even, he, he, he said about Don Jr., who's very vocal about this, her report, that you're you're just too stupid to charge with crimes like you are too dumb to crime, my little man. And so it's it's going to be talked about, I think, for maybe a week or two. Uh, and then I think everybody will move on from it. 
Uh, but um, I, I personally think it was a mistake to uh, appoint Robert Hur specifically. I think that was a mistake on Garland's part. I think he was leaning too hard in the being overly fair and bending over backwards because um, there's, there's only two Trump holdovers. Uh, in the U.S. Attorney's offices, and that's Robert Hur and uh, good old John Durham. So I think that it was a, a mistake. Now, I don't think a lot of people are saying that uh, Merrick Garland should have gone in or Joe Biden should have gone in and redacted the stuff about his memory and the, the political statements. I think that would have been a, a worse mistake to intervene or to interfere. Because as you know, Pete, if you if the Attorney General gets your report and redacts a bunch of stuff, Congress has to be notified about that. And we know Bill Barr did that with the Mueller report. He went in and inappropriately redacted a bunch of stuff to hide the breadth and scope of Russia's interference. So I don't think it would have been a good idea to interfere. I think the mistake happened when he chose Robert Hur as special counsel. But we can't go back. We can't change um, what has already happened. This might endanger Merrick Garland from continuing in a second Biden term as attorney general. He may be replaced. Uh, but as far as I can tell, um, the top, you know, the top line of the report is that there were no crimes here that, that, that could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And that he is the first special counsel to not indict. So here we are. Yeah, look, I mean, a couple of points. One, I think there is a, a, a problem in the current special counsel statute in that it requires a confidential report to the AG, which is what this was, right? I mean, it's a confidential report that Robert Herr gave to Merrick Garland, and it was laid out in a way that... Any prosecutor would lay out in a prosecution memorandum where they take a look at what they did, at the evidence. They look at the strengths and weaknesses of the evidence, whether that is the testimony of people and the credibility of their testimony, any sort of evidence where the evidence is lacking, if there are problems in collecting the evidence, if there's a gap. They weigh all these things and they set it out. And the statute requires them to do that. So in some ways, it's like I, I think it is appropriate if her is saying, I'm not going to charge Biden, that he tell Merrick Garland in a way that lays, hey, boss, because Merrick Garland's his boss. Here's all the reasons why I don't think it's appropriate to charge him. And you need to be complete in that. And it is reasonable to express whether or not you think witnesses are going to be credible or not, what sort of defenses they may or may not offer. And some of that is necessarily speculative, right? He, at the end of the day, no prosecutor knows exactly what a defendant and their attorneys are going to argue or not. But that is the purpose of a a, a prosecution memo. Now, what you'll note then is, okay, Pete, how many prosecution memos have ever been made public? And the answer is, I'm unaware of any ever. And so there is a level of privacy and protection of uncharged or even charged individuals to allow DOJ to have that very candid conversation in a way that doesn't publicly tar the individual that they're writing about, which is exactly what happened here. And one thing that it is the enduring lesson, which every single time, I don't know why even particularly reporters don't learn this, nobody reads the whole report. Nobody. I mean, like mm -hmm. 1% of the people out there. People read at most the executive summary. People more tend to read whatever the press conference or press release uh, that is given and run with that, which is why Bill Barr was so horribly corrupt in the way he managed the Mueller report, because he formed that narrative for what, a week and a half? before the report in a heavily redacted form was ever released to to begin with. Same thing with Durham. Durham, by the time he got to releasing his report, people had seen the failed prosecutions of Michael Sussman and Igor Danchenko. There had been a lot of reporting about Nora Danahy, how she had quit, how they had upset the norms of the Justice Department. So again, that that nobody reads the whole report. And DOJ ought to understand that. And, you know, again, if you're Merrick Garland, I, I, I think at some point the, you know, hewing to the traditions of the department, uh, much like the Constitution is not a suicide pact, those aren't either. And so I agree with you. I don't know. Th this whole notion that only a Republican can investigate a Democrat like, you know, Comey with uh, Clinton is is false and a, a, a poor way of thinking about things. And then the last kind of point about, you know, was was hers wording sloppy? I think in parts it was and gratuitous. I especially think it is hard to defend the focus on Bo's on, on Biden's son Bo's death, and to highlight that and say even you know he couldn't remember that with specificity, and they apparently asked him about it in the interview. I don't. If you're there's nothing classified about Bo's death that has come out. I don't know why you touch on that. I think it was a very, I, I think it was a footfall on the part of the special counsel team. I think it provided very effective ammunition for both President Biden and First Lady Jill Biden and others to go after saying, what in the hell are you getting into this with me about? 
that has nothing to do with the case. And again, if you're Rob Herr and you're a political animal because you were Rod's primary deputy and he helped him land the plane, you understand from personal firsthand experience the way this is going to play out in the political arena. I thought that was, again, it was a, sh- a crappy thing to do to Biden. I do, however, think it gave him a lot of very persuasive and sympathetic argument about, come on, man, in Biden's uh, phrase, like, why, why, what are you doing <laughs> asking me about my deceased son? Why you really want to, this is a place you want to go. And then if I, in, in the in this traumatic memory, don't, it, it just was poor form, very poor form. So I agree with you. We're not going to be talking about this a week from now. We're still going to be talking about Trump's 91 criminal counts. And, you know, unfortunately, the the continuing narrative of, you know, Biden is too old. Trump is doing his darndest to say, well, you know, Trump's even more old uh, mentally, mental acuity wise. So and we'll see how this unfolds. Yeah, well, he's calling for Russia to invade our NATO allies. Sure. So, I sure. mean, where's all the front page uh, breathless coverage of, of that? I've only seen it on like a couple of the like Jen Psaki. I, and, it's you know, a couple not of, on the New York Times or Washington Post. I'll tell you that much. No, nope, it certainly page. isn't. It certainly isn't. And you know what? There's a lot of people in this country that have never sat for a deposition and it shows. Uh, they, they, they they come at you at the beginning. And, and even in this particular case, um, Robert Hur said, I'm going to ask imprecise questions. And, and, and you are counseled before the deposition begins. Do not speculate. If you don't remember, say you don't remember. We're here to get your best testimony. Uh, and so I only want you to testify to things that you're sure about. And, you know, God, nine tenths of a deposition is, you know, I don't recall that. I don't recall. I don't know that. Uh, I don't remember that. I don't remember the specific dates. I don't have it in front of me because you can't have notes in front of you when you're being deposed. So it, it's it's seems very, I don't know, it seems very egregious to to point out that to point that out in a political manner, in a report, in an election year, just personally. Yeah. And, you know, and to the, you know, real quick about Trump's comments for people who didn't read it. I mean, this was at a speech and this is Trump's quote, just so you know what we're talking about here. This is Trump saying this. One of the presidents of a big country stood up and said, well, sir, because they always call him sir. If we don't pay and we're attacked by Russia, will you protect us? I said, you didn't pay your delinquent. He said, yes, let's say that happened. No, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them, Russia, to do whatever the hell they want. That's that's what he said. Not not just, hey, look, you got to pay your way, man. We're we're all in this together. We can't pay everything. Not only that, not not that. Not that. You I'm not going to protect you. One, Two, I'm affirmatively going to go tell them and not just tell them, encourage them. Hype them up. How how else do you explain, define the word encourage? I am going to encourage Russia to do whatever the hell they want to NATO member states. And yet somehow, Washington Post, democracy dies in darkness. New York Times, all the news that fit to print. Apparently, that's not fit to print on Monday's papers. No. no I don't get it. It's all about Biden's mental acuity. I don't it. get it. I don't get it. Well, I think um, I'm, I'm writing a book about it, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> <You> hurry up. <laughs> about money and profit in the media and uh, how independent media and folks who support independent media um, it, it creates media for the people by the people. Just like we have to take our democracy back by voting, we need to take our media back uh, by populating it with uh, uh, democratized voices. That, that's just my two cents. But anyway, thanks for contributing to Clean Up on All 45 because you help in that fight. <laughs> so thank you. Democracy does die in darkness, but there's, there are some people who are doing something about it. All right, we got to take another quick break, but we have more news. Everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Hey, everybody, welcome back. We have more new patrons to thank, including Miss Pumphrey. Christine Bridgman, Chad Hubner, Lisa Sonke or Sonke, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, Laura Marie Piscata or Pashada, Michelle 
Veronica Morris, and Michael Kramer. Thank you very much for your support. Again, we couldn't do it without you. And your support of independent media is so, so important, especially now, especially with, I don't know, Pete, why the media thinks that if they help elect Trump, that they'll still be around in a second Trump term. Um, they seem clicks, to be digging their clicks, own grave. Journalists and Gitmo barges <laughs> and Ginny's Gitmo barges. It'll drive all kinds of clicks. Media is the makes... first thing to go in a dictatorship. All right. Next up, we have a couple of updates on the clown car caucus in Congress. That's a lot of hard C's. Um, it reminds me of the old copper clapper caper. Uh, if, wow, I'm dating myself uh, with that Johnny Carson reference. But first, <laughs> Matt Gates and Elise Stefanik, two of the most mm. stable and reasonable people in Congress, have introduced a resolution to declare that Donald Trump did not ga- engage in insurrection. Uh, now, I seem to remember a photo of Elise Stefanik crouching down in the uh, upper chamber uh, for uh, hiding, you know, for her life, like r- running, hiding, cowering as as the insurrectionists attacked the Capitol. I, I seem to remember that. I have that photo in my head. I have Clyde, Rep. Clyde, cowering behind a dresser that was blocking the entrance to the door to the chamber. Uh, we, we remember, of course, Josh Howley uh, and his yakety sacks uh, half marathon that was shown during the January 6th committee hearings by my good friend, Dan Prisgoda, excellent producer. Uh, so uh, here, here we are. They want to declare, I, I don't know what for. The Supreme Court is not going to keep him off the ballot. Uh, but they want to declare that he did not engage in insurrection. Uh, so they're working on that, apparently. And also the Senate is working on passing a clean foreign aid package. This fucking thing uh, has been going back and forth. Months ago, months ago, we wanted to pass a clean foreign aid package, right? Aid to Gaza, aid to Ukraine, aid to Israel, and aid to Taiwan, the Indo-Pacific. And the Republicans demanded we won't touch this unless you put border stuff in it. And they didn't say attach HR2. They said put border stuff in it. So we did. We put all their border stuff in it. And then they tanked it. And they, they voted no on it. So now we're back to where we were months ago. Meanwhile, Ukraine is running out of ammunition on the front lines of democracy globally. Uh, running out of ammunition. And so now... They are, it looks like the Senate is going to pass this clean foreign aid package, which which was what what we introduced months ago, Pete. And so uh, we'll see. I don't know. Now, of course, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Matt Gates and the shrieking eels. Those are the shrieking <laughs> eels. They're, 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 they're saying it's dead on arrival. It's dead on arrival when it gets here. Um, it's, uh, I, I think that they'll be able if they can get the the vote to the floor, I think they'll find enough Republicans in the House to pass it because there are a lot of, of Russia hawks uh, on the Republican side still. Um, you wouldn't know it because they're constantly drowned out by the, the by the through the shrieking eels. But that's where we are. Uh, and we need to get uh, Ukraine funded. We need to get aid to Gaza. Uh, it's, it's, it's imperative. And of course, Israel needs their defensive weapons, you know, for Iron Dome and stuff so they can prevent Hezbollah rocket attacks and Hamas rocket attacks. And of course we have to protect Taiwan from China. It's all very, very important. Um, but you know, they keep trying to find a way. I, I honestly, Pete, I think it doesn't have anything to do with the border. It doesn't have anything to do with national security. They just don't want to fund Ukraine. I think they are in Putin's pocket and they, uh, then this whole thing is because they don't want to fund Ukraine. They tried to pass a straight funding of Israel bill. And President Biden was like, if it doesn't include aid to Gaza, I'm not, I'm going to veto it. And because they couldn't even get it out of the rules committee, because they're, (laughs) it can't count. They had to try to pass it uh, on uh, what, what's the, what's the term? Um, Yeah. I know what you're talking about. I'm not going to come up with it. I can't remember, but it takes, it takes uh, two thirds of the vote. To right. pass it if you can't get it out of rules committee and they didn't even come close. So it's just, it's an absolute shit show. Yeah. And I think the thing at the end of the day is going to be the power of not even the, uh, the, the Russia hawks within the Republicans in the House. And there are a couple. I think it's primarily going to be if 
Biden is persuasive that there will be no Israel bill standalone at all ever, the power of the the various constituencies who want that passed and their ability to influence Republican lawmakers in the House, I think is pretty substantial. So if there is a credible lack of an alternative that if you want to continue to provide for Israel's security, you have to take that in conjunction with aid to Palestine and Ukraine and Taiwan. And you know if they can make that stick, I think you're going to see Republican defectors if there's some sort of but who knows? I, you know, this is all Donald Trump. Donald Trump, again, remember Donald Trump, the guy who said he would encourage Putin to take action against NATO members, encourage it. That's who's pulling the shots in Congress. They are all listening and taking the cues from Donald Trump. And it is absolutely clear that in addition to him stating that he's going to encourage Putin to go after NATO members, that there's no way he wants any aid to Ukraine going. And again, figure out, you, you, couldn't, you couldn't dream of a better storyline if you're Vladimir Putin or the Kremlin. This is just, this is completely from a tactical and a strategic perspective, or whether it's fighting on the ground in Ukraine, whether it's a long-term undermining the NATO alliance, all of this is exactly what Russia wants. And it's appalling to me that so many members, not just Trump, but all of these enablers in positions of Republican power are just falling into line. It's disgusting. Yeah, no, truly. It's truly disgusting. And uh, as as Nikki Haley said, I mean, Nancy Pelosi, as <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> I see what you did there. As Nancy Pelosi said, with you, all roads lead to Putin. So. All right. So from D.C., let's head down to Georgia, where we have some updates on the Fulton County District Attorney's racketeering case against Trump and all of his co-defendants. As we know, the hearing over Mike Roman's motion alleging a conflict of interest motion is scheduled for tomorrow, as you're listening, Thursday the 15th. Attorneys for Roman have subpoenaed several people to testify during that hearing, including Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade. Both of them have filed motions to quash those subpoenas. This is from Fonnie Willis's uh, motion. Defendant Roman has taken the extraordinary step of attempting to subpoena numerous members of the district attorney's office to a February 15th hearing in support of his ill-conceived motion to dismiss the indictment and disqualify the district attorney's office. The effort should be promptly brought to a close. Georgia law, as well as authority from across the country, predictably frowns on a process that permits counsel for one litigant to compel the testimony of counsel and employees of the opposing party. And there is no justification to depart from that general principle here. As there is no factual basis that could reasonably justify requiring opposing counsel and other employees to be a witness in the case, the state respectfully requests that the court quash each of the subpoenas served. Continues, upon information and belief, counsel for defendant Roman has not spoken to any of the above named witnesses and cannot with any degree of accuracy or good faith relay to the court the content of their anticipated testimony on any relevant issue. Instead, each of these subpoenas appear transparently to be an attempt to conduct discovery in a rather belated effort to support reckless accusations made in prior court filings. The subpoenas should be quashed. And then finally, the indiscriminate breadth with which Defendant Roman has sought to secure testimony from district attorney employees is troubling and suggests an eye toward public narrative as opposed to legal remedy. In addition to the attorneys and investigators tasked with investigating and prosecuting the case against Defendant Roman, who appear on his subpoena list, other district attorney staff with no knowledge at all of the issues raised in Roman's original motion have received subpoenas. To include District Attorney Willis's executive assistant, investigators involved in her security detail, and personnel responsible for general operations. Defendant has not demonstrated any need for these witnesses, let alone cleared the compelling need hurdle. Nor can he represent what relevant testimony these witnesses may possess, as his attorney has not spoken to any of them. Harassment and disruption of this type should not be entertained. And then finally, Defendant Roman subpoena to special. Prosecutor Wade's former divorce attorney is a similar effort that the law does not condone. Mr. Bradley is a former business partner of Wade, but also represented Wade in his divorce proceedings. Any relevant information Mr. Bradley may have, and the state disputes he has any information relevant to any pending matter before the court, is protected by attorney-client privilege and is non-discoverable. So, you know, there's, but, you know, that's not it with, uh, with Roman, right? 
No, no. I mean, there's more. You know, Trump has filed a response to Fonnie Willis's rebuttal of Mike Roman's allegations. Uh, you'll remember Chile and Trump both filed to join Mike Roman's motion. So now Trump wants to respond to the DA. And in it, he doesn't mention anything about the conflict of interest or relationship. He just goes on about the quote unquote racist remarks she made at the AME church and how they were racist against him. And that should be grounds for disqualifying her. Of course, we'll let you know what happens. Um, there is a hearing right now going on right now, Pete, as we record this episode on the motions to quash six to consider per the judge. Um, and I'm reading here from Anna Bauer's live feed of the proceeding. Uh, awesome. The individuals who moved to quash include Fonnie Willis, Nathan Wade, uh, Robin Yearty, a longtime Willis associate, Wade's law partner, Chris Campbell. And the judge set out what he thinks is relevant, relevant to the disqualifying inquiry, whether a relationship existed, was it romantic, when it was formed, and whether it continues. Those questions are relevant only insofar as they relate to alleged personal benefit in the prosecution, if there was any. And uh, the judge said some issues raised in defense motions are not relevant, including Wade's experience, the alleged lack of experience handling RICO cases, the alleged violations of Fulton County regulations and municipal code, and allegations of forensic misconduct by D.A. Willis. None of those are going to be considered. And the judge is basically having the hearing right now. He started with the motion to quash, filed by Anna Cross on behalf of D.A. Willis. And uh, Mike Roman's attorney um, subpoenaed nine members of her staff, as as you just went went through. All of the witnesses subpoenaed, he says, there will be no witness who would dispute the affirmations by the Wade affidavit, and the defense is bringing you gossip, and the court should not condone that. That's what Cross says for the DA. Uh, and then on behalf of Mike Roman, his lawyer says, um, there are disputed issues of facts. This lawyer says Wade filed a pleading in his divorce case that he didn't have a relationship with anyone during the marriage, but he subsequently updated those interrogatories and pled the fifth. You know, he, the, the merchant, who is the attorney for Mike Roman, didn't address why she subpoenaed various witnesses at all. She said Wade's former law partner, um, that Bradley guy you were talking about, he can testify to disputed questions of fact regarding when the relationship started and whether people on the DA's team knew about it. So that hearing is going on right this minute. Um, it's, I don't think, you know, we might not... Um, get a ruling here. In fact, Anna Bauer just said that McAfee agrees to defer the ruling. So once we have it, of course, we will discuss it on the next episode. Uh, but that's that's what's going on right now in this case. Yeah. And I think, again, I would not be surprised if a lot of these things will get deferred until the hearing. I think there is a certain large amount of fishing expedition going on by Roman you know, but again, he doesn't. The, the purpose of this is not an intention or desire or an expectation on his part or his defense team that they're going to get all of these uh, subpoenas. I mean, they're just slinging uh, crap up against the wall and seeing what, if anything, sticks. And if they can get one or two wins, uh, you know, again, whether or not they have legal merit or not, but something that plays into a narrative, uh, you know, they're going to do it. So I would expect uh, not a lot of success, but, you know, I don't know that they went into it expecting a lot of success. Yeah, agreed. Um, all right. We have to take one more quick break, but we have one other story um, I wanted to specifically cover with you, Pete, because it involves uh, the FBI and maybe a little bit of uh, homegrown terrorism. So everybody stick around. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Our final list of new patrons to thank includes Marty Dilger, Linda L. Kerr, Carolyn Thalman, Marcy Dunow, Bocce Balls, Shannon O'Reilly, Tom Donnelly, and Mary Maroney. Thank all of you so much for your support. Thank you for making this possible. And, uh, you know, again, day in, day out, every week we do this because of your support. And thank you enormously for that. As Allison mentioned, our final story of the day comes from Gideon Hess at Rolling Stone, who writes, a Tennessee man allegedly plotting violence at the southern border with militia groups to stir up the hornet's nest with an arsenal of explosives, AR-15s, and a sniper rifle was arrested Monday after selling an undercover agent an unregistered AK-47 suppressor for $100, according to a federal criminal complaint. Paul Fay Sr. said he planned to serve as a sniper 
in a confrontation with federal Border Patrol agents and to coordinate with the militias from Kentucky, Georgia, North Carolina, and Tennessee, an FBI agent wrote in court documents unsealed Monday and first reported by Seamus Hughes of Court Watch. The FBI says Faye hoped to inspire a domino effect, encouraging others to join in confrontations with federal officials. He had spoken to a North Carolina Patriot Party militia group member who had visited Eagle Pass, Texas, the site of a standoff between state and federal authorities over border enforcement that has inspired threats of a potential civil war from right-wingers. Under Governor Greg Abbott, a Republican in Texas, uh, Texas has installed razor wire along the Rio Grande and insisted they will continue to do so even after the Supreme Court ruled federal authorities could remove it in order to gain access to the area. All but one of the nation's Republican governors signed a letter supporting Abbott, and 14 of them appeared alongside him on Sunday in an Eagle Pass press conference claiming his border actions are justified and necessary. Several members of Congress have also supported Abbott, including House Speaker Mike Johnson, Republican from Louisiana. Some militia groups see the confrontation as an opportunity for violence, according to the complaint. Quote, I'll be the first one on the scene and the last one to leave, unquote. Faye allegedly told an undercover federal agent as the two examined his truck, quote, the reason why I say this is, or the reason why I say that is, if something, just say that we were going down like that before you even put yourself in danger, I would be on top of that roof right there, zeroing out, taking out anybody, unquote. Wow. Wow. So Faye uh, said a friend named Alpha could Hmm. make him explosives. He said he can go under the kitchen sink and come out with napalm. That's what Faye reportedly said. He also claimed to have tannerite to produce claymore mines and told agents he had butane tanks set up on his property as booby trap explosive devices to be triggered if police showed up. Faye did not realize he was speaking to a federal agent when he sold a silencer that an ATF expert later determined was unregistered. And I don't know if you know this, but you cannot have an unregistered silencer. Federal prosecutors charged Fay with possessing, selling, or transferring an unregistered firearm, and he's been assigned a public defender. Organizers calling themselves God's Army, Pete or We the People, have hyped a a peaceful take-our-border-back convoy that was a trucker convoy, another one that was supposed to bring 700,000 concerned citizens from multiple states to border sites at Eagle Pass, Texas, Yuma, and uh, that's in Arizona, and San Ysidro, California, over over that weekend. Instead, like 100 people showed up. And they were fighting amongst themselves. So so it was just, it was a cluster, uh, uh, as you know. And... um, I wanted to ask you specifically about like these undercover agents. I mean, so thankful that they're there uh, intercepting this kind of talk about literally going down with a sniper rifle and claymore mines that his friend is going to make under his sink or whatever, a napalm and, and going down and, and killing federal agents who want the access that they're supposed to have under the constitution to continue to do their job to protect our border uh, that's currently being blocked by National Guard. So what what is that sort of a, I mean, I guess you have to, like, what's the process to get somebody undercover? Like, do you have to hear chatter and then send somebody in? Like, how's that work? Yeah. So the the first big takeaway is that, look, you can't, the FBI isn't just out there with undercover agents or undercover employees trolling around trying to find people who are saying crazy stuff. You have to have a predication to introduce an undercover. So there has to be an open investigation. I was reading and and I haven't, I only read the, uh, the initial, uh, thing that Seamus Hughes reported, but, um, whether or not there's any indication of what caused the FBI to open in the investigation. Because by the time you're introducing an undercover employee, you have other information, right? There's been something that has caused you to open a case. And then depending on, you know, how, what the scenario is, maybe you have somebody who's an undercover that you can introduce quickly, or maybe you have to go out and identify somebody and, you know, do what's called backstopping, you know, come up with a, you know, something to make them appear to be a legitimate person who would be interested in buying a silencer. And so that if, you know, this guy does anything, uh, you know, sort of cursory background investigation online that, oh, this person looks legitimate. And he expressed what's interesting is, according to the, the public records, he expressed all kinds of concern and noting that, well, you know, the FBI undercovers and federal uh, undercover agents are all over the place. So there was already some paranoia there. But long again, short answer to that is there was something 
else that caused the FBI's interest. And then the second big point is like for, for Greg Abbott and for all these Republican governors who are supporting him, a huge, if not overwhelming reason for doing this is political theater, to hype up the threat from the border, to hype up how only Donald Trump can save us from that, to hype up how Biden is doing nothing, notwithstanding the fact that no Republican will vote for actual money for the best border bill that any Republican has seen in a generation. Setting that aside, it's political theater. But the problem is, in a population of, what do we have, 350 million people in this country? Not all of those people are highly educated, mentally stable individuals. Some people have gone down rabbit holes of conspiracy theories. Some people are not in the best shape mentally. Some people are prone to violence. Some people, allegedly like Paul Fay, are willing to get up on a nearby roof and zero in and start shooting agents. That is well established and we have seen it time and time again from people like this from the you know the knucklehead out in i think utah or idaho who was threatening joe biden and merrick garland and all kinds of other people who got into a you know firefight when agents showed up to try and talk to him and end up getting killed to the woman who's in texas who was threatening judge chutkin there are people to caesar syok who was this followed Trump around at campaign events and decided he was going to start mailing explosive devices to all kinds of public and media figures. The fact of the matter is, when you get a group of people numbering in the tens of millions, there are going to be a tiny percentage who are not well. And for whatever reason, and there are going to be some people who are well, right? People who say, uh, who are dedicated Christian white nationalists who believe that the way that they are going to get rid of the racial problem in the United States is to have a race war and who are accelerationists and believe the sooner we can get to the shooting, the sooner we can establish a white America. And they're going to glom onto these things, not just through hateful speech, but through hateful and sometimes violent behavior to achieve that end. So that's the backdrop of what exists and has existed for a long time. What's I mean, that was here, Timothy McVeigh and Terry Nichols. I was here before that with Randy Weaver at Ruby Ridge. That has always been around. What's different is we haven't had dozens of Republican governors essentially thumbing their nose at the Supreme Court saying, no, don't care. We're going to keep our razor wire barrier designed in a particularly malicious way to like not only trap people, but cut them and drown them if they come across it in the middle of the river. And we are going to engage in this performance theater to fundraise, to get Donald Trump reelected. And as a result, the byproduct of that is people are willing to engage in violence. And it's a problem. And it's, again, it's getting worse. It's not hidden. It's not, un, oh, nobody could have foreseen this. Nobody could have predicted this. No, a lot of people are foreseeing and predicting it and it's coming true. And it's not getting better. It's getting worse. And when we go from kind of the slow boil of, you know, we haven't had the conventions yet and Trump hasn't started trial yet and, you know, it's not the hottest summer yet, it's about to be all of those things. And we're not moving. We're moving in the wrong direction, not the right one. Yeah, no, um, I agree. And and I, I it's um, like we've long asked ourselves, like, oh, gosh, what do we do if these Republicans defy Supreme Court orders? Are we looking at a constitutional crisis? We're at that point. They are openly defying Supreme Court orders. Uh, and uh, I'm waiting for, uh, I don't know, um, what, are they just going to sue them again? Uh, are they going to start indicting people? Like, I, I don't, I don't, because we've never been in this position, it's like, what is the fast and correct remedy? I mean, obviously, arresting people like Faye. Uh, and continuing to do your best to whack a mole when it comes to these individual lone wolf, rugged individualist terrorists who want to go down and shoot federal agents. Um, but like you said, we've been dealing with that for a while. It's just seemed it seems to be on steroids these days. It seems to be uh, getting drugs from a White House pill mill uh, <laughs> under the Trump administration. It's, somebody was saying, "No wonder all these people needed to be sedated. Look, look at all of them. Of course, they needed." Like, this. Oh, it's terrible. And I don't, I'm really curious to see what, what's the federal government's next move? Because the Supreme Court's ruled and Texas is, it appears, kind of thumbing their nose, but maybe they're letting them have access and making a big public display that in reality, behind the scenes, they're being compliant with the Supreme Court order and they're just saying things to the contrary. I don't know, but it seems like a untenable position for the state of Texas to get in the way of the U.S. government from doing their border control 
responsibilities and have the Supreme Court rule in the federal government's favor and for just nobody to do anything, just let that go. So I'm curious to see. Yeah, how this... maybe, maybe we'll see an application for a writ of mandamus uh, where the Supreme Court just has to order them. Uh, I, yeah, but that that's kind of what a Supreme Court ruling should do already. Uh, it is an order. Uh, so I, right. I'm I'm at a loss. Uh, Rhoda Mandamus might have a little more oomph, but I don't think that uh, these folks are gonna. Oh well, you know, rid of Mandamus in that case will back right off. You know, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem like uh, something that's in the cards. So um, we'll see how uh, the Department of Justice handles it. Anyway, thank you everybody so much for listening to the show. We had so much news to get to today. We tried our best to squeeze it all in. We will keep you posted on the hearing that's going on right now with Judge McAfee on the motions to quash in Fulton County. We'll keep you posted on uh, whether Trump uh, asks Judge Barbara Jones if he can have $83 million to put into an escrow account for aging Carroll. We'll we'll be following it all, and especially when Justice Angoron uh, comes down with his ruling in the New York Attorney General civil fraud trial. Uh, We'll see how that ends up turning out. You know, I had said, I don't think it'll be 370. I think it'd be closer to 225. But now that we've talked to Ben Mysalis about the $50 million loan, maybe that'll be added on and we're back up toward 300 million. But we'll see what he ends up saying and when he ends up saying it based on his review of Barbara Jones's reporting. uh, And of course, um, the, the potential perjury plea that might be being, Um, but which we haven't confirmed, but, you know, New York Times reports is happening at the Manhattan DA's office. We'll have it all for you. Do you have any final thoughts before we get out of here, Pete? No, I agree with you. I think it's going to be up above 250, so a quarter of a billion dollars, but I I would not, I would not be surprised to be still waiting for this in about a month, but I, you know, we'll see. But again, like we said, this is not the parting of the clouds for Trump. These are storm clouds getting increasingly worse, so... It's coming. Yeah. And as it's Monday, as we're sitting here, uh, I believe Trump has said he's going to file a motion to stay his immunity. Um, And that just the act of him filing that will continue the stay. The the, the D.C. proceedings will not the stay will not be lifted until the Supreme Court uh, either treats the stay as a as a cert petition and grants it and and sets an argument schedule or denies the stay, and uh, they may take a week to deny the stay. Uh, and during that week, we are still stayed in D.C. And if they deny the stay, then the whole thing uh, is done. That's the final uh, m- ruling on the matter. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals opinion stands, and the D.C. the D.C. trial can proceed. Either way, uh, I see the D.C. trial happening before the election. Uh, but we'll just sit. I think it's just a matter of how soon before the election. <laughs> There's one oh, scenario man. that it could end on October 30th. <laughs> going to be close. It's going to be close. We're cutting it close. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. We'll be back next week. And for patrons, we'll, we'll see you at the bonus episode this weekend. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joel Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.